These stories about <clears throat> monsters hiding under our beds have been around for centuries all around the world. It's very interesting how so many cultures and so different countries have their own iterations on it. There is the boogeyman. There is the sack man who takes naughty children away in a sack. And in some cultures, the monster is female. So no offense, guys. <laughs> now, psychologists argue that this narrative made its way into our folklore because of the dangers that our ancestors had to face back in the days when we were still sleeping in caves, like dangers of wild animals creeping in at night. And others say that it's just something made up by parents to make their children behave and just go to sleep and leave them alone at night. But in the end, if we are to break it down a bit a little, it's just something that explores a very common and a very basic human fear, which is the fear of the unknown and of the hidden. My name is Diwana Bota, and I'm here to discuss today our own industry's boogeyman, which is Legacy Code. Just a little bit of what I do. Um, nothing groundbreaking, really. All the speakers are the same. Dev, lead, blog, speak at different conferences. There's a cool photo of me when I once flew a plane, which makes me look interesting. And then there's the company that I work for called Spotlight. But I'm not going to go into too much detail about this one. I'm going to come back to this later. Right. So what is legacy code in the end? There are a few definitions out there, if you are to Google this question. Some say it's code written in technologies that are no longer supported or maintained. Some say it's code that doesn't have any testing around it, integration testing, unit testing. Um, others say it's just code written by people who are no longer around. They left for other jobs. They were a third party in a sourcing company. If we are to be honest with ourselves, we also use legacy code as an umbrella term for code we love to hate. We love to blame other people for it. We would never write something like that, right? <laughs> but let's put it on a, a new, fresh angle. In the end, all code becomes legacy code. It's like an organism. It grows old if you don't look after it, if you don't nurture it. It becomes frail, it dies, it gets replaced. Just like biological life. Now, it might be the case that a few people here attending this talk thinking this would be something um, where we would join together and this legacy code and complain about it and at the end just feel better about ourselves, how amazing we are and how we're not making those kind of mistakes anymore these days. And this talk is not about that, actually. It's about um, coming with, with a different message that legacy code is good and is lovable. And sometimes it can be one of the best things that happen for your career as a software engineer. And why is that? It's because it's difficult. It's a challenge. It's much more difficult to read code than to write code. This is a known, a known fact. No one can disagree with it. Right. So we're here to change our mindsets and replace the complaining with something else, with a can do at it too, with confidence, saying that, yes, I can take a look at this code, 20, 30-year-old code, and understand it and build new systems around it. Or, yes, I can fix this bug in production in legacy code without needing to have the person who wrote this in the same room as me explaining what the hell this magic number does, and if I change this, will the whole thing blow up? Right? It's about confidence. And as the picture says about dealing with it, really. <laughs> so there's another practical aspect that I also like about legacy code. And we have to face it. It's true. Where a lot of the times where there's legacy, there's revenue. Um, in a lot of cases, it's, the revenue, it's this revenue that pays for our salaries, and it pays for innovation and for new projects coming in the company. So what do we do after we change the mindset, after we stop complaining? The truth is, there is no one single answer that would fix it all. It depends a lot on the circumstances, on the code base, on the company. 
And there are several options there. The most extreme one is to just replace it, throw it away, build a new thing from scratch, boom, it's done. But this is also very expensive and it takes a lot of time and not a lot of companies have the luxury to do that. So what other people do is like taking a bit more of a step-by-step -step approach, like isolate that code as much as possible, build around it, build this new thing, throw this one away, build this one, throw another thing away, so on and so forth until the old thing disappears completely. If it falls under that definition of code that just doesn't have tests around it, and maybe the technology is new enough so you don't really need to throw it away, well, this is what you gotta do. You have to write tests for it, integration tests, unit tests, until you become comfortable enough, confident enough to change it, to refactor it, to make it better. And when we do that, there's this golden rule that we mustn't forget, which is don't change too much at once. It's easy to get carried away, but the truth is no one wants to review pull requests with 200 files that were changed. We have to keep, keep our focus, right? Do, think, do things one step at a time, one pull request at a time, sometimes even one sprint at a time. We've done that. And we also need to learn from it because there's a saying that smart people learn from their own mistakes while brilliant people learn from other people's mistakes. And we want to be those brilliant people, right? And we want to keep our new code clean because if I'm standing here today feeling miserable about this big ball of mud that I need to decipher, I don't want to do the same thing to the person who's gonna be in my chair in five years time looking at my own code, right? I want to make things as easy as possible. I want to stop propagating these bad practices. Now going back a bit to the company that I mentioned, I'm working for, and this is an interesting one, and it's not a sales pitch because we're quite niche and members need to get vetted and <laughs> so on. Um, but this company has been around since 1927. Our code base is not that old, obviously. <laughs> it would have been interesting if it was. Um, it started by publishing books. Internet came along. New shiny website came along. It was shiny for its time. Books stopped, online presence only, a few more years went by, and we started having issues, right? Um, the website didn't look modern anymore. It looked old, it looked dated. It didn't appeal to people. Um, we could not expand internationally. Um, we had all these old technologies, like classic KSP, which no one cares about these days, right? We had these humongous store procedures with weird triggers. You change one thing here, then surprise, another thing changes way over there. Um, Everything was so coupled together, the front end, the business logic. And one other important thing happened. The dungeon masters left the company. The people who were there when that code was written, or at least part of them, found new jobs, pursued them, and there was like a bunch of us, newish additions to the company, who faced a choice. We rather leave the company as well because we don't want to deal with this. We just run around like headless chicken, complaining about it, not understanding it, or we just get the job done. So we chose to get the job done. <laughs> um, what worked? In our case, I think the most important thing that happened was building APIs. I cannot stress enough how important APIs are. It's like, I love them to death. It was the major thing that helped us break away from the big ball of mud. And then a few more things happened. Um, we switched away from this vision of having one big website that would do everything and that would be concerned with all the types of different users like performance, costing, writing, agents, so on and so forth, to a farm of front apps, smaller front end apps. But teams can work in parallel. So we could push this one today and the other one today. We can release new things in production. And there's also feature switching right? You want to have a bit of flexibility. You want to be able to revert things, hide them away if something is not quite right because you missed something. And then we wanted to, make able, to be able to have our website translated. And this is very important for everyone, not just people working with legacy. If your company starts today, if you have like this side project, this startup, and your market might be in the UK today, 
Well, think about it. In a few years, it might not be that. It might be China. It might be Middle East. So you don't want to couple language to functionality. This is very important. This is what worked for us. We're almost there. Last, of, last pieces of the old thing are dying away. Probably going to have a party at the end when <laughs> the last piece of code will, will just be killed and thrown away. Um, what I'm trying to say here is it can be done. And it can be done in a sane and fulfilling way and in a successful way. Thank you very much for your time.